And we're ready to start. We are recording. All right. Well, good day, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here. My name is John Dernbach. I teach at Widener Commonwealth Law School in Harrisburg, and I direct the Environmental Law and Sustainability Center here. Uh, welcome to our Distinguished Environmental Speaker Series. Uh, believe it or not, this is the 12th year of our speaker series. Uh, we've made a point of inviting uh, highly qualified speakers from a variety of backgrounds and perspectives. And we've made a point of giving our speakers the opportunity to reach beyond the academy and into the broader community, which is why we do this program late in the afternoon and why we do it on Zoom. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Hannah Weissman. She's professor of law at Penn State Law School and State College. She is also professor and Wilson faculty fellow in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences at Penn State. She teaches and writes in the areas of energy law, oil and gas law, land use regulation, environmental law, and administrative law. And her work focuses on the mechanics and the design of regulation and governance in these areas. I got to know her uh, some years ago when she was teaching at Florida State's Law School through her meticulous and detailed work uh, state by state on shale gas regulation. She has published articles on these topics in a variety of law reviews. She's the co-author of several important texts in energy law. Professor Wiseman received her undergraduate degree from Dartmouth and her law degree from Yale. She clerked for Judge Patrick Higginbotham on the U.S excuse me, of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Uh, she has practiced law in Kansas, Missouri, and Tennessee. When she was practicing law, she represented a wide range of clients on hazardous substance liability, environmental impact assessment, wetlands designation, site mitigation, and other environmental issues. Her presentation today is Greening Clean Energy. Our one administrative announcement before we begin, uh, for those who want CLE credit for this program, uh, please see the link to the evaluation form that will be put in the chat feature. Uh, you have to fill out the evaluation to get the credit. So with that, please welcome Professor Hannah Weissman. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And a bit intimidating because uh, John has been a, a, a leader <laughs> In, in the energy and sustainability world uh, ever since I entered the academy and long before. And he was very supportive to me early in my career and encouraging. Uh, so uh, again, a bit intimidating to be speaking in front of someone who I viewed as at, at, at the front of this field for so long, but I greatly appreciate this opportunity. And I'm speaking today uh, on a topic at the intersection of environmental law and energy uh, because it is increasingly recognized that the greatest environmental problem of our century is climate change because climate change impacts all other environmental problems. And a variety of publications have recognized the uh, increasingly urgent need to do something about the environmental problem that eclipses all problems. Uh, so we see here several reports, the, the cover pages of these reports. There's one out of Princeton, uh, uh, John, uh, as well as Michael Gerard wrote, I, I would say the original text in this area on how, how we get to a lower carbon world. And, and yeah, with the introduction of why do we need to get there? And then there have also been a number of other publications in peer-reviewed journals and elsewhere, noting the need to reduce carbon emissions to address this looming environmental issue and how clean energy, uh, replacing uh, higher carbon energy sources with zero carbon sources is uh, must be at the forefront of this effort. So the Princeton report, I think some of these words are just quite compelling. Uh, so Princeton says, long after the terrible challenge of COVID-19, uh, we must uh, address climate. The climate change challenge will be marching on as the 21st century's most dangerous and intractable threat to global society. And the authors say it's most dangerous because it affects every aspect of our lives. And it's intractable because 
about 80% of all of our energy still comes from fossil fuels, so we have a long way to go. This is quite a project we have ahead of us. The AGU advances report uh, cites to the, the scientific body that, that presents the risks, uh, consensus-based findings by scientists. Uh, and many, most of you in the audience are probably already know this number, the 1.5 degrees Celsius point uh, beyond which there are concerns that climate impacts could be uh, quite, quite bad, e even worse than we are seeing now. And eventually, uh, sometimes people use the term terminology cataclysmic. And, and there's a growing recognition that this transition needs to happen soon, uh, ideally by mid-century, if we are uh, to have any hope of limiting uh, average temperatures uh, to the goals set forth uh, by international bodies. We, are, of course, are already seeing the impacts of climate. I, we, and many of you spend much of your lives uh, in this area. I'd imagine I just want to touch on a few that maybe have been more compelling recently. So the, the fire season in the recent summer, I believe it was last summer, even in Pennsylvania, we had air quality warnings, right? Uh, from the fires in the West, uh, the particulate matter blew all the way over to Pennsylvania. And I was told that my children should uh, we're, I should be careful to bring my children outdoors with the amount of particulate matter blowing in from the West. Um, there's an interesting peer-reviewed study looking at how many more people are likely to be impacted by wildfires as we have more drought in the West. Uh, and looking just at the West, the estimates are more than 82 million people uh, starting in 2046 um, from this peer-reviewed report. Another impact, uh, this is a map from National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, reminding us of the, the weather changes, the, well, the localized weather and then climate, the longer term climate changes occurring where we live. So the West is tending to get drier. This is, these are changes in annual average precipitation, looking at the past three decades in comparison to uh, 20th century precipitation. Uh, so in general, the West is getting drier and the East, including Pennsylvania, uh, the darker the green, uh, the more annual average precipitation occurring. Uh, so we could go on and on about the impacts, but I won't. Uh, I'll talk about the solution and the challenges associated with climate mitigation solutions. Uh, so replacing fossil fuels is, of course, a, a massive endeavor, especially when we look at doing so in all sectors of the economy, whether we're talking about stoves and furnaces and homes or heating uh, in businesses, uh, industrial processes, and then, of course, transportation. Uh, transportation being the largest emitter of carbon in the United States. Uh, We'll have to rely on zero carbon fuels, such as green hydrogen produced with renewable energy, or we'll have to electrify uh, more things and pr uh, produce that, uh, generate that electricity with renewable sources. Uh, and we, of course, will also have to replace much of the existing electricity generation in the United States with zero carbon generation. I am focusing mostly on solar today because Pennsylvania is in the midst of somewhat of a solar boom. Um, but of course, wind is also a leading renewable energy source, zero carbon energy source in the United States. Nuclear is very important, especially in Pennsylvania. And then biomass, hydropower, and geothermal are the other major renewable energy uh, zero carbon sources, with biomass being somewhat debated in terms of uh, the, the carbon. The, the extent to which it is zero carbon. But th these are the big ones. There are, of course, other zero carbon sources. Uh, and solar will be the focus of my presentation because of where we are geographically. Uh, and I'm a relatively new entrant to the Commonwealth. I've been here for two years now. Um, so I'm hesitant to speak about too much about Pennsylvania policy specifically, but I I'm learning as I, as I transition from my understanding of Florida to Pennsylvania. Uh, and there is, to me, uh, this, this important document, although it's just a goal, it, it, seems, to be, it seems to be driving uh, some of the energy development in the state. 
And of course, it aims for 10% of in-state electricity to be generated from solar sources by 2030. And I'm focusing on the land impacts here because the challenge of clean energy that seems quite pressing now, it's not just the, the cost of transitioning uh, or, or getting support, uh, getting enough political support for the transi transition and, and the voices in this process, it's also just the local impacts because energy is an intensely local endeavor. Uh, a power plant produces electricity for a broad area if it's a utility scale power plant, but it is sited typically within one community, sometimes several communities, some large renewable farms cross municipal boundaries or even county boundaries. Uh, so we have this electricity flowing to a large portion of the state or even beyond Pennsylvania, uh, but the generation of it uh, impacting the communities that host uh, the, the power plant. And when you look at the numbers, if we were to get 10% of our electricity from solar, it's a very small percentage of total Pennsylvania land. But I think to the communities experiencing the development, it feels much bigger than this. Uh, and sometimes that's a beneficial thing and sometimes it's not. Uh, now, when we look at this from a national perspective, how much land would we need if we were to supply all US electricity with solar photovoltaic generation? Th these are old numbers uh, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, but in 2004, we could have supplied all of our electricity using 10 million acres of land. And NREL likes to point out that's about half of the amount of farmland that, rem that, that are idled purposefully each year under the Federal Conservation Reserve Program. Um, so if we look at Conservation Reserve Program acreage, uh, amount of solar PV land needed would be about half of that. Again, though, you, know, you can look at these things from the bird's eye perspective, and maybe they don't look so consequential. Another number NREL likes to use is uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is approximately 19 million acres. So, we would, we would need about half of that to supply all of our electricity from solar. Again, though, from a community perspective, the community hosting a solar farm might say, well, that's all well and good, but it is impacting us as well. Uh, this is the Penn State Light Source BP uh, solar project, one of them. Uh, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, similar scenes from some of the utility scale uh, solar projects being built in Pennsylvania, uh, including often on farmland. I think the challenge here, the challenge of getting communities on board and welcoming rather than opposing renewable energy or other low carbon generation is that a, a decent number of people, of course, not everyone, but a, but a decent number of people are on board with the fact that climate change is an important issue and should be addressed. I, I think there are many differing opinions about the uh, urgency of addressing this issue. Uh, but climate impacts are widely distributed. They affect everyone and they are occurring now, but they will also occur well into the future. Whereas the impacts of a solar farm are now and they're very visible. Uh, the community hosting the solar farm sees and experiences the trucks carrying the equipment to the sites. Um, the, the temporary impacts on soil during the construction phase if the site needs to be graded. As I understand it, many of the sites don't actually require uh, that much alteration of the terrain in Pennsylvania. Uh, some do, uh, but there are impacts during the construction process. And then of course, throughout the 20 to 30 years of the life of the solar farm, uh, there are ongoing visual and other impacts. Uh, including during the life of the solar farm, uh, uh, more limitations on what can occur on the land underlying the solar panels. Of course, after the 20, 30 years, the land can go right back to what it was before. It can be farmed again, or, or uh, you know, once the panels are removed, uh, but there is this displacement of some uses uh, while the solar farm is in operation. So I think the, the challenge here is we're balancing, we know there are very powerful climate impacts, but they affect the whole world. They don't just affect us. 
and they 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 go far into the future, whereas the impacts of clean energy are more visible, more concentrated in local areas, and therefore uh, tend to attract uh, concern from communities. And I would argue that community community opposition opposition because of this, because of the sort of psychological difficulty of balancing more diffuse now and long-term harms of climate sort of out here with the here and now at the local level, there's a large solar farm proposed that will uh, change the, the, the view of the landscape, could impact wildlife corridors, et cetera. I think that balance is quite difficult and understandable as people try to wrestle with uh, these conflicting challenges. Now, of course, there are many local benefits to solar, especially to farmers um, hosting solar panels. Uh, it appears, and I, I, I hope to uh, do further work with Pennsylvania farmers to better understand uh, their views on this subject. But the literature suggests that, that many farmers throughout the United States support solar farms because of the lease payments they receive in many cases, it seems that, that these lease payments can allow farms to stay in business. They're far less volatile than revenues from crops, for example. Uh, but again, there are impacts that the entire community are also concerned about. And then many of the benefits from these solar farms, just as the benefits uh, of reducing car carbon flow to the national level, so the benefits of the solar itself in terms of employment. Uh, much of the employment in the case of solar farm construction is local, but some of the benefits flow more broadly, uh, the economic and employment benefits. So I'd like to talk some about solutions to this challenge. The challenge of mitigating the impact, mitigating the carbon that is causing climate change and its impacts as well as mitigating, uh, reducing the impacts of the clean energy development necessary to get us to uh, lower carbon. And I'll focus on four solutions, mostly on the regulatory side, but also others. So my, my short phrase is, how do we green clean energy? Meaning how do we reduce the impacts of all of this clean energy that will be needed to reduce US carbon emissions? And I think much of this will need to be from the regulatory side, but not all of it. Uh, I think we can also greatly improve uh, community engagement in renewable energy projects and developer consideration of, of the impacts when project when when developers go in and build a solar project in a community, uh, they they can better understand and address community concerns if we enhance the participatory process associated with this. And I'm going to focus especially on community benefits agreements in which renewable energy developers work with communities and sign a contract uh, about how to address the impacts that are at the forefront uh, of the community's process. Uh, also, there are just physical ways to reduce the impacts of green energy infrastructure, such as solar farms, one of which, uh, two of which, in fact, are identified in the Sol Penn Solar Future Report, but I'd like to focus on what other states have also done in this area. And that is to, instead of placing most solar on green fields, uh, land that is currently relatively undeveloped, including farmland, instead of, or in addition to, you, you, you can kind of move some of that development away from green fields onto brown fields, which are previously developed or contaminated sites. Um, there are all sorts of terms here. There are red fields, there are gray fields, there are brown fields. Brown fields are the already developed but contaminated sites. Red fields and gray fields refer to sites that are previously developed and are sort of partially abandoned or are sort of not making money, you know, think of the shopping malls that have one store left in them or something. Uh, maybe we could put some of this land to better use uh, with, with solar and similar in installations. You can also co-locate solar with highways and, and other existing infrastructure. Transmission line access is an impediment here. 
but it's another solution. And then we'll talk about the possibility of focusing on smaller scale solar in addition to utility scale, uh, which is another consideration in the, in the Penn Future report, the, the solar future, but something I'd like to address from a more, a, a broader, more national perspective. All right, so the regulatory angle, how do we make clean energy uh, more, more of a green resource itself, one that has fewer impacts on the communities hosting the energy? Uh, now, some states have taken the approach of, well, we really need the green energy and we think we can address the impacts best at the state level. Uh, and now, this is a bit similar to the approach that the Pennsylvania legislature took with respect to uh, natural gas development. Of course, this, this did not ultimately work uh, due to the Robinson decision from the Supreme Court. But uh, just as Pennsylvania tried to say, we're taking, we're taking a statewide approach to the regulation of oil and gas development, and we're going to require municipalities to accept that development, essentially. This is what some states have done for renewable energy. I am not advocating this as a solution. Uh, I'm just noting that this is one approach. I think there are limits uh, to this solution because I think if you take too much authority away from local governments, uh, this will uh, move in the opposite direction of accommodating community concerns. Now, I think it is possible to centralize some of the decision-making process but it must be done very carefully if we want to ensure that community concerns are addressed in uh, the regulatory approval process for solar and other zero carbon energy. Uh, so New York, of course, has taken uh, this preemption approach quite recently. Many of you probably know about this already through its Accelerated Re Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act. Uh, for relatively large renewable energy systems, 25 megawatt plus, the approach is what I call preempt and pay. So these, these larger renewable energy systems are now approved at the state level and the communities that host the systems receive payments, mandatory payments uh, from the renewable energy developer. Those payments are distributed through uh, reductions to consumers' electricity bills in the communities where these, uh, these renewable energy systems are located. Uh, Wisconsin also takes a somewhat of a preemption approach they don't fully preempt the decision of, of, over the siting of renewable energy, however. They set what's called a regulatory floor. Um, and actually, I should call this a ceiling. If the more correct term is the ceiling. <laughs> I'm going to fix this right now so I don't confuse you. The regulatory ceiling. Uh, Wisconsin says that the state standards for renewable energy are. They're, they're pretty much the, the, the most restrictive standard, the most uh, protective standard for the environment that is allowed. And local governments may not exceed that, which is why it's a ceiling, sort of a cap. There are exceptions, though, in which local governments may go above the ceiling and the ceiling becomes a floor. So if local governments can prove that a restriction they are placing on a wind farm in Wisconsin will protect public health or safety, or not significantly increase the cost of the system, or allow an alternative system that is similarly efficient with return in terms of producing electricity from a renewable energy resource, the local governments are allowed to exceed the cap on regulation. All right, so that's one approach. And let me just show you a bit the, this New York, this is a relatively recent New York order, February 2021. Uh, saying how communities will be paid, the communities that will have to accept wind and solar development because it is being approved at the state level now, they're called host communities, uh, they'll receive $500 per megawatt of solar generation that they are hosting and $1,000 per megawatt of wind, and that will be distributed again through consumers' utility bills. Uh, I think there's controversy about this decision to distribute the benefits through utility bills because when people see this on their utility bill, it won't look like much of a benefit. It'll be like $2.50 off of their bill. Um, other payment programs considered would be an investment in a local park or constructing a new local park. 
for example. And I think in some ways, those, those types of payments might have been more palatable to communities. And I would compare this to uh, Pennsylvania's gas well impact fee, right? Which distributes dollars to communities in a very different way. They can use those dollars on uh, public infrastructure, public environmental projects within their communities, as opposed to this New York approach uh, for paying communities for the impacts of renewables. Uh, here's another regulatory option, which I think might be a more promising one. What a state can do is it can identify the best locations for zero carbon uh, energy development, be that solar or wind or something else. And then it can let local governments still make the, the zoning and siting decisions uh, within those areas. So uh, Texas has done this. Uh, Texas, uh, I'd say, is the leading example of this because Texas has more wind energy than any other state. So the Texas legislature established these things called competitive renewable energy zones. And you see these blobs, the purple and the sort of brown and the blue and the yellow here. These are areas in Texas that have the best wind energy resources, the strongest wind, wind energy, the most consistent wind energy, and also have fewer competing land uses. And so the, the Texas legislature directed the Texas Public Utility Commission to map out these areas and then to mandate that utilities, that uh, trans, transmission and distribution utilities in Texas build transmission lines running from these windy areas to the load centers, Austin, Houston, Dallas, et cetera, the, the areas where people are consuming the electricity. So with the identification of the zone where it made the most sense to build renewable energy, plus the promise of transmission lines that would be available, the wind industry took off in Texas. And this was not a preemptive approach. Local governments uh, still could place restrictions on how and where the wind energy was built, but it, it provided a sort of statewide uh, land use planning mechanism for renewable energy. Uh, Maine has done something a bit, something similar. They have something called expedited permitting areas, which are the areas in Maine deemed to be the most beneficial for renewable energy generation. Uh, and there are incentives for renewable energy developers to build in these areas that have been identified uh, as implied by the statutory text. Uh, permits for proposed renewable energy projects are issued more quickly in these if, if developers build in these areas that have been identified as being ideal. A similar option, one that New York State is also taking, is something called turnkey siting, which is where a state, a state identifies areas and basically pre-permits those areas for renewable energy development. Uh, and New York calls these build ready sites, other places call, call them turnkey sites because essentially a developer can come in and just start building without having to get all the permits. So as New York describes this, a build ready site is a site for which the authority, which this is a New York authority, a state authority has already secured permits, property interests, agreements, and other authorizations necessary for development. Uh, now, New York is doing this along with preemption, right? So New York is saying the state of New York will approve where renewable energy is cited. Uh, local governments are preempted in that regard. And New York is going to identify and pre-permit sites so that renewable energy can be built more quickly. But this, these turnkey sites do not have to be accompanied by preemption, right? We, we could example, uh, envision a scenario in which uh, a state said, here are the areas that we think are best for renewable energy. And, and the state could even work with the local government to determine whether the local government would likely support a renewable energy project on that site. And then the state could go about getting the necessary environmental permits. Uh, uh, there are helpful tools for any states taking this type of approach, trying to identify the best areas for renewable energy development. And there's especially a tool that will help ensure that renewable energy is not being built in the areas that are most important for species, especially as wildlife species migrate as a result of climate change. Uh, so the Nature Conservancy is something called a resilient land mapping tool, 
uh, where you can identify the site that might be used for renewable energy installation and determine whether it has been prioritized by scientists at the Nature Conservancy as an area of land that will be important for uh, species, uh, including as, as species main habitats move uh, northward, as well as higher in topography as a result of climate change. There are other important tools if states were, were to go, go and identify the ideal sites for renewable energy, uh, especially from the perspective of farmland, um, soil maps identifying prime agricultural soils. And of course, these types of data can be incorporated into regulations. So in states such as Maine, uh, Maine has some state level regulations for siting of wind, and they include considerations of the quality of the soil at the site and what, whether very high quality soils are being impacted. Uh, planners can also align renewable energy development uh, with wildlife corridors in mind. So when, when planners are identifying, for example, a solar or wind energy zone, an area where there's a, a lot of sunlight and it's relatively consistent, they can also think about, well, how could we line up the potential solar farms to create a migratory corridor for wildlife so that wildlife would not be interrupted by fencing? Uh, at the local level, uh, assuming there's not preemption of local control, uh, in a state like Pennsylvania, where there are many, uh, many local governments, I continue to be amazed as I learn more and more names of boroughs, townships, all of the different local governments here. I, I think the states can, and Pennsylvania already is, help helping by providing guidance and guidelines for potential regulations to include in local solar ordinances. Um, there can be provisions for agrivoltaics. Uh, there can oh, even a mandate that the development of solar enable um, some form of agricultural activity. Usually I don't think we would need an agrivoltaic mandate because most solar photovoltaic panels are already developed in a way that allows for raising sheep or turkeys, for example. Uh, but if uh, communities are particularly concerned about the impacts of solar development on agriculture, uh, there are other provisions that could be included in ordinances, including, for example, channeling development toward uh, uh, away from the prime agricultural soils and more toward more the marginal soils. Other provisions can be included to make this development greener, such as requiring wildlife permeable fencing. You see this on the bottom. This is another tool suggested by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, as opposed to this sort of chain link fence on the left, I don't know if you can see this in the picture, uh, you can have fences with bigger holes in them that would allow uh, wildlife like foxes to pass through the fences. Uh, local governments can incentivize or mandate certain features at solar sites that would enhance the habitat, um, bird roosts or, or bat boxes and whatnot. Uh, there, there can also be provisions that require the developer to plant and or maintain pollinator friendly or native vegetation. And there are of course decommissioning requirements, which are very important. And as I understand from the work of uh, experts such as Mohamed Badisi, they're, they're quite variable in Pennsylvania. And in some cases, I think the provisions for decommissioning might rise to the level of discouraging solar development. And this is where I think we need to find a balance, right? Of ensuring we're allowing the clean energy development to move forward, but also addressing concerns about what will happen uh, to these solar farms at the end of their useful life. And so I think it's a, it's a matter of finding bonding provisions that aren't prohibitively costly, but ensure that there will be money there if needed uh, to remove the equipment and properly properly dispose of it. Okay, so that's, those are some of the regulatory changes that could help to green the development or make the development of solar less impactful. I wanna talk now about the process and participation of communities within the siting process. There is so much talk of process, uh, but I think there's still much to be learned from a growing literature on how to make 
uh, policy making, decision making procedures uh, truly uh, open to the public, and not just open to the public, but in allowing public engagement in the process. Uh, there's been much discussion in the literature of moving from a model that used to be decide, announce, defend, meaning a local government will make a decision to allow a solar farm, announce that de decision, and then address all of the pushback. Now, I know many local governments in Pennsylvania have, have already moved well beyond this model. They have held numerous public hearings and, and addressed a variety of of stakeholder concerns through public hearings and other measures. Um, but I think there are ways to go even further here. Now, at some point, of course, there's concern that, it, with, that too much process can unduly delay needed projects. So again, this is a matter of finding a balance. But what the participation literature su suggested as, as moving to models of informing community, getting them involved earlier in the development process, I'm consulting with them beyond just holding public hearings, maybe even having focus groups or smaller um, uh, sort of, you could, you could even appoint uh, energy commissions at the local government level, citizen-led energy commissions who meet with the developer on a monthly basis, ways that involve the community beyond holding public hearings. And then the most aggressive participatory model uh, says we should even empower communities, get them involved in these renewable energy projects. Um, if, if the landowner where the solar project is being cited is amenable, could there be a community group that got involved in the planting of pollinator friendly species or, uh, or maintaining uh, that pollinator habitat? Are there ways to get the community to the site and involved in the site in a way that matters to them? I think one way of effectively engaging communities is this mechanism called the Community Benefit Agreement. It has lots of other names, good neighbor agreements, impact benefit agreements, mutual benefit agreements, the on and on, lots of names here. Um, but what, no matter the name assigned to these agreements, what they are is they are literally a contract between the developer of the project, in the case of renewable energy, a solar, wind, or other developer, and then a coalition of, uh, from the community or the government itself. In some cases, the local government, the, the council um, or other local government elected entity, the board will sign the contract with the renewable energy developer. Uh, and there are some states that incentivize these sorts of community developer agreements, Maine within its expedited wind energy development areas, uh, it prioritizes projects that provides uh, significant tangible benefits to the communities in, in which they're located, uh, including uh, providing money to those communities or uh, otherwise benefiting them. Uh, some of the best practices in terms of community development agreements, uh, they've been much more common internationally. I have, so I have a picture here of an interesting agreement between a wind developer in Australia uh, with an ab aboriginal people in, in the area where the wind towers and turbines were being built. Um, they agreed upon a, an indigenous art project that would uh, occur as part of this development project. But some of the best practices emerging from the international context, as well as some agreements that are starting to arise in the United States, are making sure that this happens very early in the process, well before the developer even selects a site planning in advance for what will closure look like. So there are lots of local governments in Pennsylvania that have decommissioning requirements, but, but there can be more extensive discussion of closure and revegetation of the land as part of the contractual community benefits process as well. Mapping stakeholders, trying to ensure that all of the important stakeholders are at the table when the community benefits agreement is reached. Ensuring there's a mechanism for monitoring to ensure that the developer is holding up its end of the bargain and some sort of grievance mechanism and, uh, for members of the community, community to argue that there are, there are departures from the contract. I'm, uh, this is just an example. I'm skipping through some of this quickly because I want to allow time for questions. This is from Morro Bay, the California. Uh, there, uh, there's an offshore Morro Bay 
Castle Wind development that involved a community benefits agreement. I've just provided some of the text of that here. Okay, just a couple more slides on two, two other ways to make renewable energy infrastructure less impactful. I mentioned infrastructure co-location, just as the, the Pennsylvania solar plan notes. Uh, there we can, in some cases, avoid green fields and instead site solar farms on the median strips and highways. This is an example of Oregon uh, cited a solar, a solar farm near a farm. You can see a farm behind it, but this was actually a, a rest area, a sort of safety stop rest area in Oregon that was par partially repurposed what we call the Valdoc Solar Highway. And Oregon's Department of Transportation has uh, a plan for how to encourage more solar energy uh, on the area in the, in the middle of divided highways and other areas near highways. Um, New York also incentivizes the construction of, of renewable energy on non-green fields by cutting the, the promised permitting time from one year to six months for projects so cited on brownfields landfills and other already developed areas. New Mexico also prioritizes renewable energy projects that are cited on lands previously impacted by mining. And finally, another option here uh, that Pennsylvania has already noted in its solar plan is to go smaller. Um, we could avoid some of the impacts of renewable energy if we put solar on rooftops. Once again, National Renewable Energy Laboratory has some useful data. In 2004, they said that we could supply all US electricity needs using only 7% of our existing built infrastructure. And this is just a little snippet from the Pennsylvania solar plan. Uh, scenario A considered a higher percentage of small scale generation. Scenario B assumed uh, more uh, utility or grid scale solar. And as noted by Pennsylvania, there are costs and benefits to the smaller scale approach. It is more costly. It is far more costly. It's at least two to three times more costly to, to build the actual infrastructure, but it does create more jobs. Um, one tool that's very useful, uh, if we're going to be focusing more on rooftop solar, Google has Project Sunroof that allows you to map out the, the roofs that are better situated for solar energy. Just one final tool I'll note in case some of you are not aware of it. National Renewable Energy Lab has a, a free permitting tool for local governments that cuts the time required to, for a, an inspector to approve a rooftop solar energy installation from something like one week to a couple of hours. And it includes um, the, the same years for the National Electric Code, et cetera, that Pennsylvania currently follows. So this app is quite useful to any Pennsylvania local governments that would like to make the permitting of rooftop solar an easier endeavor. And with that, uh, I, I know that was kind of a whirlwind tour. I look forward to questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hannah. That was really quite wonderful. Um, and I, I think an overview of a great many different options that I think will be food for thought for a lot of folks. Um, I just uh, entered a, a, a note in the chat to say you can put questions in the chat, um, but I don't see any questions in the chat right at the moment. And so maybe if you have a question, uh, why don't you raise your electronic hand and I'll see if I can find you. There are more people here than I can see on the screen. and so. I think an electronic hand will bring you to my attention. Well, failing that, at least for the moment, maybe I could ask a question to get started here, um, Hannah. Um, all the different practices that you've described, are there some that look to you based on the experience that you've seen to be more successful than others? Uh, from an international perspective and the, from the few US states that have done this, I think the 
the competitive renewable energy zone or whatever you want to call it, solar energy zone approach has been quite effective because one of the impediments to moving renewable energy projects forward is of course the, the transmission obstacle. And so if, if you can tell renewable energy developers, we figured out where the transmission is or where it will be. And we've also addressed many of the land use impacts that are likely to come up in the siting process. We've pre-addressed them. I think that's, that's quite appealing from the developer side, but it can also be beneficial to communities. Um, because if you do a good job in, of involving communities in the process of planning where renewable energy can go and, and getting those concerns in before anything is built uh, and, and using tools such as the resilient wildlife areas mapping, you can, you can address the community concerns while also ensuring that renewable energy moves forward. I think that the, the turnkey option is, is quite promising, but hasn't worked very well so far in its implementation. So the federal government tried something similar with the Smart from the Start initiative on federal, uh, for federal projects. The idea was, let's, let's look at renewable energy projects very early, uh, even before they're, they're built, and let's figure out what all of the environmental obstacles will be and try to address those uh, up front. Uh, but, but I'm not exactly sure why, why Smart from the Start didn't take off more. I mean, I, I guess it is quite an endeavor from the perspective of the agency, right? If the agency is, is essentially doing all of the permitting work for the developer, that's costly from a government agency perspective as well. So I think that that model is a good one, but it would need a lot more fine tuning for it to work well. All right, well, well thank you. Uh, Tom Au, you have a question. Um, okay, yeah, now I'm unmuted. Thank you. Uh, it seems like uh, the problems that you've uh, raised with regard to solar, or at least utility scale solar projects, are similar to the problems encountered by uh, wind power projects. Um, and I, you know, what you are proposing is uh, basically is a set of best practices for government and for the industry to overcome these problems. And I was thinking of um, the, that the Commonwealth has um, engaged in leasing solar power from, an, I think, a dozen um, utility scale solar developers. And I, I had asked one of the developers in York County about what practices uh, they would be engaged in. And they include, uh, including um, uh, the development on a uh, basically farm. Um, so, what I encountered with her was that the, the developer had thought about um, integrating farm uses with the solar project, such that the solar, solar project would not prohibit um, raising and other uh, crop um, uh, 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 planning and, and such. Um, the other interesting aspect of that was that the project would not require any new infrastructure to connect to the electrical grid. I think you know those are among best practices that could be implemented uh, to minimize the impact of uh, utility scale solar. Um, so is, has the industry um, um, as a whole um, collected a series of best practices? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the American Wind Energy Association has done a lot of work in this area, uh, including best practices for development on agricultural land. I'm not aware of, of any coming out of the Solar Energy Industry Association, but I bet it's there. I, I think SEIA has been working. In fact, now that I think about it, I think the Solar Energy Industries Association has been working with uh, potentially with, uh, with Sunrun. So there are lots of best practices out there. One of the leading ones is, is Sunrun. They provide tools uh, 
or sort of recommended provisions within local ordinances. Uh, so yeah, I think, and, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory has done a surprising amount of best practice development uh, for local government, not just uh, from the perspective of you know, permitting rooftop solar, but, but all sorts of other suggestions for the types of specific provisions that could go in local ordinance to address, ordinances to address impacts. Um, I thought your point about uh, developments that do not require any new infrastructure for connection to the grid, that's a key one because transmission projects, of course, encounter even more opposition than solar farms, understandably. And uh, developers are already trying to follow that practice because building new transmission is very quite expensive. The problem is the, the existing transmission cannot accommodate all the new renewable energy we need. Now, Pennsylvania, we, there's quite a bit of transmission already because the energy exporting state. But if we look at a nationwide basis, 200,000 to 400,000 new miles of transmission lines would have to be built. And that's, that's a big deal and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a tough, uh, it's a tough one because transmission lines are not the most popular project to have in your backyard. Um, so I think any, practice that, any, any practices that can connect to existing in transmission infrastructure should certainly be prioritized. Thanks for that great question. Other questions? And I think I see some in the chat, John. Do you want me to just sort of address them? If I got not got, if I missed that in the chat, hold on a second. I see here. one from Howard. Okay, I might, I must not. Um, I'm not okay, seeing can, that question. I think I might be a host. Do you want me to just address them in order? Does that work? Uh, yeah, or you could make me a co-host, and I could help you with that. I don't know how to make you. I, yeah, uh, Brian can help with that. Okay, Why don't you go ahead and answer the question. Sure. So I see one from from Howard. What effect do you think the Pennsylvania Environmental Rights Amendment will have? I think given, given recent decisions uh, from the oil and gas context, I think it, it could have several effects. I think um, if Pennsylvania were to take the approach that it tried in the natural gas context of largely preempting local control, it might run into a similar challenge in that we know there are you know, some environmental impacts of renewable energy development they're different from the impacts of, of gas development, but I think there could be concerns that, um, you know, preempting or, or requiring local governments to just accept renewable energy installations could create impacts on the public trust resources of the Commonwealth. Now, again, though, you'd be, you'd be balancing that against the fact that the, the, the mission of, of speeding up the development of renewable energy is to address this looming, well, already here issue of climate change which sort of engulfs all other environmental problems. Because if you look at species extinctions caused by land development, as opposed to the more widespread extinctions caused by climate change, for example, climate is, is the big, big problem. So I think, the, I think the court would have a tougher time of deciding whether uh, the impacts of, of the renewable energy development were problematic from the perspective of Commonwealth resources as compared to the impacts of continuing to rely primarily on fossil fuels and uh, and cause further climate uh, effects. I don't know. I don't know where it would, would come out, but I, I think there would certainly be. My guess would be there there will be challenges under the Environmental Rights Amendment. Uh, the next question, and I don't know. If, please speak up if you have questions in response to my 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 answer. Um, the next question I see is, is the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection proposing any regulations along the lines? Um, not to my knowledge. They, they are being very supportive, as I understand it, in terms of providing guidance to local governments. Uh, so I think the Department of Environmental Protection um, is a very important resource for the, as I, it's 2,000 plus local governments here, right? <laughs> uh, in terms of suggesting potential best practices for writing solar ordinances. Um, because as Professor Bradisi at Dickinson Law has noted, many local governments don't have any solar ordinances right now. Uh, a, a number of local governments are in the process of writing them. Um, but the state, as I understand it, sees itself as sort of just the information, primarily the information provider at this point, rather than uh, uh, taking uh, measures such as identifying 
renewable energy zones. But I welcome any additional comments in the chat because again, I'm, I'm continuing to learn more about Pennsylvania as I live here and, and become more enmeshed in the, in the local renewable energy uh, issues. Uh, another work, I, another question I see for everyone is legal work in Pennsylvania done primarily on behalf of local governments. This is something I'm, I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, it, it seems that local governments are exceedingly important here uh, because uh, issues such as the siting of even large scale renewable energy remain within the power of these governments. Uh, and I have done a little work with the associations that bring together the local governments and provide resources to them. They seem quite strong. Um, the lawyers who work for those associations seem to be providing important assistance to the many local governments that are wrestling with issues such as how do we get communities on board with, with solar. Uh, but if anyone else has comments on uh, legal work being done primarily on behalf of local governments, I'm, I'm interested seeing them in the chat or elsewhere. So John, those are all the questions I saw. Have you, have you seen any others? Uh, no, it looks like you were getting those questions directly. Um, and that's, that's oh, not really- Oh, I see, they're going to me, that's why. Okay. Yeah, that, no, no, no problem there. Just a quick comment though is um, the sustainability practicum class that I teach, we have students drafting ordinances on a bunch of different energy related topics, including microgrids this last semester. Um, and um, as, as well as wind farms, and it might be useful for you and I to trade notes about that at, at some point in the future. We should trade notes. I had a class, uh, I had a similar experiential class that helped consider potential model ordinance provisions for solar. So I'd be interested in seeing uh, and seeing what, what your students came up with as well. And that reminds me, uh, I had a slide briefly mentioning community solar. You mentioned microgrids, it made me think of community solar. That's another issue that the state legislature, of course, has been working on taking up, as I understand it, many years in a row. But, but an exceedingly important issue if we do want to move more towards smaller scale resources, uh, because we will need some sort of enabling provisions uh, for community solar to move, move forward in Pennsylvania. And in my understanding, we will need, we will also need more enabling laws on the microgrid side. So a question for you in, in not seeing other questions. Um, let's say that a local government is starting to think about what to do about climate change, but is also interested in turning um, the climate change issue into an economic development issue for, it, for itself. Um, what would you recommend that that local government do to get started? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. Climate change is an economic development issue. Uh, I think some of the successful programs I've seen elsewhere are uh, starting at the, the, the local university or college level. So if there's a, a community college or, uh, or similar institution, or even at the high school level, uh, getting the education programs in place to train uh, uh, people to do these jobs. I think that's key um, so that that when uh, the developers come into town, uh, there are there's local labor available um, and uh, training for uh, rooftop solar installation. Also key. We don't there. You don't have to rely on, you know, an external, you know, some large utility company coming in to decide to, deciding to build a large solar farm. Uh, rooftop solar can sort of create grassroots support if you have the people in the community who can install it. Uh, that can be a big driver of economic development. Uh, beyond that, I, I, think, I think it's important to get the ordinances in place uh, to make clear that the local government is welcoming of, of certain efforts to mitigate or adapt to climate change. Uh, because I think regulatory uncertainty can be an impediment um, to any, any businesses interested in entering a place and, and engaging in, in creative projects. And I think the more proactive the ordinance can be, you know, maybe even creating mini renewable energy zones, for example, and saying here are the places we've mapped out that we think would be 
uh, beneficial for this type of development um, could be useful. That's helpful. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions before before we, we conclude today? Uh, you'll find in the chat, Brian just posted this. If you're um, looking to get a CLE credit for this, uh, you'll see a link in the chat right now. Um, and um, I also posted a link to the uh, the place where at least Widener has posted, that this law school has posted to some of the work that the students have done. And you can find that on the chat. Um, I didn't do it very elegantly, but I think the, the link is underlined and so you should be able to to, to pick up on it if, if, uh, if, if you're interested. Um, it's 5.01 uh, and uh, this has um, uh, been a terrific hour and uh, we really appreciate uh, on behalf of the law school, uh, you're uh, attending this program and uh, we hope to see you again. And thank you so much. If you could give some form of electronic or other recognition